Vayechi, and he lived. This weekly Torah portion concludes the book of Genesis. It ends on a good note. When the sons of Jacob are peacefully living in Egypt, in the region of Goshen. Although next week, we will discover that the children of Israel will become slaves. Next week, we will read about Moses' birth. We will meet Moses, and we will stay with him throughout the rest of the Torah. In this weekly portion, Jacob is giving his sons the final blessings. Then Jacob called for his sons and said, Gather around so I can tell you what will happen to you in the days to come. He is blessing Joseph with the famous words, Joseph is a fruitful vine, a fruitful vine near a spring. Ben Porat Yosef, Ben Porat Ali Ain. This ancient blessing is used till this day, mostly in the Eastern Jewish communities. It means that you will be blessed as a fruit growing near the waters. And it reminds us of the first psalm. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. This is answering the question about who will be happy and successful. And the answer is clearly walking in the ways of the Lord. Whoever walks in his ways will receive his reward. However, this psalm does not say that following the Lord is enough. It also gives us a warning to avoid bad company and negative influence. The person who walks in the ways of the Lord and abstains from bad influence, this man does not choose something easy and simple. Because the easiest thing is to give yourself some slack, to allow self-pity to get the best of you, to think there is no way out. Everyone is against you, and there is no hope. It is much harder to take responsibility and to work on your own improvement. The person who is able to get up and decide to follow the Lord, decide not to look for shortcuts or seek distractions from their problems. The person who takes responsibility and works hard to improve himself and his surroundings, what will happen to such a person? And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Such a person will succeed. Similar words are found in Jacob's blessings of Joseph, also in Psalm 1 and in Jeremiah 17. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. He shall be like a tree planted by waters. This blessing is given to Joseph, who, as we remember, is successful in everything he did. He is successful because God, in his faith in God, was his top priority. His faith in God is what guided him through life and helped him to overcome temptations, like Potiphar's wife. Jacob is calling his children to bless them. The Torah portion, Vayechi, contains more messianic prophecies than the entire book of Genesis, maybe even the entire Torah, prophecies about the Messiah in the messianic era, like this one. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he to whom it belongs shall come, and the obedience of the nations shall be his. He will tether his donkey to a vine, his colt to the choicest branch. He will wash his garments in wine, his robes in the blood of grapes. Judah received the internal promise of leadership. Traditional Jewish commentators on this verse said, this is the King Messiah. They say kings and rulers from the tribe of Judah 
will lead our nation for several centuries. And from this tribe will come the Messiah, the eternal King. And all the nations will be bow down before him at the end of times. This verse, along with other texts in the Bible, became the foundation to Yeshua's famous words in the Gospel of John. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. And then, I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. The Bible often uses images of wine, grapes, or vineyard as an allegory to the Messiah and or to the nation of Israel. Like the famous comparison of Israel to the vineyard in Isaiah chapter 5. The nation of Israel is like a beautiful vine planted by a gardener. Jeremiah compares Israel to a choice vine as well. We are the vine. We are the vineyard planted by God, but it also hints to the Messiah. These texts from Genesis and Isaiah prepare the ground for Yeshua's parable. I am the true vine, says Yeshua, and you are the branches. Then he takes it to a practical level. Bear fruit, produce fruit. Yeshua continues his sermon and says, this is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. How do we honor our Heavenly Father and prove ourselves to be Yeshua's disciples? By producing fruit, by doing good. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. We have to love each other in the same way the Messiah loved us. And a big part of it, is to serve our brothers with our God-given gifts and to forgive each other. The theme of forgiveness is present in our portion. As we are getting closer to Jacob's death, the brothers begin to worry again. They are really scared of what could happen after their father's death. Will Joseph finally punish them? Will he revenge his years of suffering? Will all his accumulated anger finally burst out? I personally think that they invented the story that on his deathbed, Jacob asked Joseph to forgive his brothers. I do not think that Joseph told his father about what actually happened there in the Dotan Valley, in that dry pit. I think that he succeeded to turn his traumatic experience into a success, into a blessing. I think Joseph had changed. I think that Joseph is already living the blessing of Jacob, a fruitful vine near the spring. He learned how to not fall into the deep pit of self-pity. Joseph planted himself in God. That's why he is successful and his actions are blessed. When Joseph was younger, a teenager, he used to snitch on his brothers to tell his father about their wrongs. And who knows, maybe if they would have met earlier, then maybe Joseph would be angry and vengeful. But I think not. I think this interchange happened in Joseph already in Potiphar's house. Because God blessed him there. Everything he did was blessed by God. Joseph changed. And we see that when he was falsely accused of rape, he did not open his mouth. He went to jail silently. He learned to keep his mouth shut. That is why I believe that Joseph did not tell his father about what actually happened in that dry pit of Dotan. But the brothers fear Joseph. It is natural and understandable. When Joseph's brothers saw their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs 
we did to him. The brothers are afraid of Joseph. And I think they are lying again in the similar way that they lied to Jacob when they brought him the striped coat stained with blood and said, your son is dead. They are lying to Joseph. So they sent word to Joseph saying, your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. We can learn a lot from Joseph's reaction to their words. When their message came to him, Joseph wept. Why is he crying? Because he knows what he shared with his father and what part of the story he kept for himself. But here too, Joseph did not abandon God's ways, the way of forgiveness. He is not angry at them. He did not plan to hurt his brothers before, and he is not going to do this now, even when they are trying to cheat him again. Joseph sees the situation in a different way. When he told them, you intended to harm me, even when you had bad intentions, even when you wanted to hurt me. Nevertheless, there is a God to this world. And at the end, everything works for the best, as God intended it for good. We can see here a great example of forgiveness. Even if we were wrong, even if we were hurt, forgive and be merciful. Who knows? And maybe the wrongs against us will serve a greater good. Maybe it is part of a bigger picture, which is yet hidden from our eyes, as God intended it for good. Forgiveness and the ability to forgive is very important. It is one of the basic principles in the New Testament. I think of Yeshua's saying, to turn the other cheek. It is one of the most famous quotations from the New Testament. It also is one of the most controversial, as there will always be a smarty pants who will come to a believer and ask, what will happen if I slap you now? Will you turn your other cheek or will you hit me back? I believe that Yeshua is talking about the concept about the very idea of forgiveness, about uh, the way of life. Yeshua is not talking about a slap in the face. And even, even if he meant it literally, behind his words stands a great idea to stop acting in revenge. Yeshua is teaching us self-control, wisdom, compromise, and forgiveness. These qualities are sometimes more important and are healthier than getting the maximum vengeance. Revenge does not always mean justice. On the contrary, revenge often means that the circle of pain and suffering will grow. I think that Joseph turned the other cheek to his brothers. He could have got the revenge for what was done to him. And he could get back to them for their continuous lies, including the fabricated dying wish of their father. But instead, he turned the other cheek and gave God all the glory. What you did to harm, God intended for good. One of Yeshua's important and beautiful parables is found in Matthew chapter 18. And it is called the parable of the unforgiving servant. Yeshua is telling us a story of a great and rich king who decided to organize his accounts and deal with all who owes him. One of the servants brought before the king had a debt of ten of thousands silver. This servant had no way to repay his debt. He had no money and the king orders to sell him, his wife, and children to slavery and use the money to repay the debt. The servant began to plead before the king with tears 
asking for mercy. Please give me more time and I will return my debt. The king decided to be merciful and forgave him his debt. Then the same servant whose great debt was forgiven went out. He went out of the king's palace and met his friend who owed him a hundred dinar, a very small amount compared to his own debt to the king. What did he do? The servant demanded to receive his debt and did not show mercy to his friend who was pleading on his knees in the same way he himself was asking for mercy from the king. The servant did not show any mercy, but demanded that his friend's wife and children are be taken to jail until his debt is paid in full. When the king heard of what this servant did to his friend, he called him back to the palace. The king said to him, I showed you mercy and forgave your great debt. You should have done the same to your friend. And now, in the way you did not forgive your friend, I will not forgive you either. The king took the evil servant and sent him and his family to jail until he will repay his debt in full. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Yeshua is teaching us the importance of forgiveness. We must be merciful towards one another. We must forgive one another, knowing that we have been forgiven as well. And on this note, we are concluding the stories of Genesis. May we all be blessed. Chazak chazak v'nit chazek. Shabbat shalom.